We gotta go to the bullpen. Welcome to the Highland Bullpen, the all-new podcast bringing America's pastime to Scotland shores. It doesn't matter if you're a Hall of Famer heading for Cooperstown or you're fresh out of the minor leagues, this is the podcast for you. Welcome baseball fans to the latest episode of the Highland Bullpen and hurrah, we're all celebrating, we are going to get a full season of Major League Baseball after the the players in MLB resolve their issues, we can now all look look forward to what we want to see, great baseball being played on the parks around America. However, it's never simple. And as we speak, there's news coming out of New York that might have a big impact on how the Yankees and the Mets start off the 2022 baseball season. So before I bring in Alan and Yorkshire, Dave, we'll go first of all to, to young Dave, who is a man in the know as regards New York. Thanks, Richard. Um, for those of you that can't quite see us just now, we are in the middle of Central Park in New York. So uh, bringing this deal live from, from our sources here. In if the only. <laughs> not, yeah. quite the bud- not quite quite get the budget yet, but... <laughs> uh, so the talk in the last couple of hours um, is just against fans and media outlets start to get back into the baseball is going to be on our television screens and uh, hopefully attending as fans through the course of the year. Uh, there are some state laws. State laws might be the, the incorrect terminology uh, for America, um, but you get the gist of where we're coming from. Um, but in New York City, so that's the metro area, not the not the state overall, but the, the city, um, there is law in place that to enter your place of work and to be around colleagues, you must be vaccinated, um, which has caused some problems in the baseball world. I think that's with the New York Nets, perhaps. Um, I'm not too closely following any of those teams. Um, no, sir, it's a different New York team, but I'm sure Alan will know. He's probably been to see them. Um, But yes, if you're an employee entering your place of work in the New York metro area, uh, you need to be fully vaccinated, which, as we know, there's been quite a hesitancy among professional athletes uh, across the world, uh, across various sports. Uh, And the feeling is that with the New York Mets and the New York Yankees about to partake in the baseball season coming up in three weeks time, that there could be a number of their players who are not vaccinated yet. And it gives the club and the players a little bit of a a quandary exactly how to play that out over the coming weeks. We don't know, could New York um, actually bend to the will of any pressure from the public or from these private firms looking to coin in quite a a bit of significant money? Not too sure, but it seems to have just been broken in the last hour or so online. And there's a a whole lot of debate as to how... um, Baseball can really take that forward. Uh, I, I know, you know, not to drop Dave in it, but Dave mentioned earlier that there's been a sort of ongoing uh, similarity with Toronto, given that Canada have got their own laws. Um, so do, I don't know, Dave, is that quite similar to what's happening north of the border? Yeah, I think um, I just noticed on the Red Sox website their comment about vaccination status for Toronto. And um, it did say that players may not be able to may not be allowed to travel if they haven't had their COVID jabs. And um, it's certainly certainly relevant for the Red Sox last last year. I think last September, Red Sox ace Chris Sale said he wasn't vaccinated. There was a couple of other guys, Xander Bogarts, Christian Arroyo and Josh Taylor. But I don't know what their reasoning behind that was, whether they were particularly opposed to it or they hadn't just done it. I know Chris Sale was just coming back from serious injury. So... Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but I think Canada in general, I think it's just um, the, the the Blue Jays that you need to present a valid, pretty much still need to present a valid negative test result when you enter the country. I couldn't I couldn't swear to that, but I think that's what it is. But um, yeah, it's definitely, uh, I mean, Alex Gore was asked to comment and he just said, well, we don't play them until the end of April in Toronto. 
um, we've got time to sort that out. So I think he was avoiding any potential controversy and, you know, uh, I suppose not really being allowed to speak to the players for the last 99 days. So, um, yeah, hopefully they get that sorted out because it would, uh, they can't be the only club with players who um, are not fully jagged. And, and Alan, I think you made a good point that it almost feels like this has caught the New York teams on the hop. It seems to have caught them by surprise. Yeah, it's a bit strange that it suddenly comes up. It's a fairly well-known rule. And I think young Dave referenced, is it Kyrie Irving, Irving, who plays for the Brooklyn Nets. So this has been ongoing for a wee while. And he only... He is not able to play the home games for the Nets. Um, and interestingly, actually, within the last day or so, the Nets have been fined because he attended a game. Uh, I don't know if they play at Madison Square Gardens. I know one of the basketball teams does, but he attended a home game, sat in the front row, which is all permissible for an unvaccinated individual. But after the game, he went into the locker room uh, whether to celebrate or to chat with the team. And the Nets have been fine for that because they've allowed him in there. So the basketball season must have started, is it September, October time, possibly? And it's a well-known story from then. I, I remember reading at the time, and he's entitled to his views on whether he gets vaccinated or not. But there was one comment he apparently made which said he was prepared to take the loss of earnings um, by only playing the home games. So his contract must be that he gets so much. So the, the poor guy, I think, has had to forego his $60 million a year or whatever it is and only get $30 million a year. So on that point of principle, to to only have that level of salary for the year, you've got to, you've got to admire the guy. Uh, obviously, I'm being a tad facetious there, but much easier for somebody in that position to make that decision and maybe he feels he's got an opportunity to lead. F fascinating when you look at the big finance companies and what have you that, that must work in New York and and, and small individuals, um, businesses, uh, because that obviously causes people who need to put bread and water on the table for their family at dinner time, quite, a, quite an issue and quite a responsibility. The, the baseball teams must have been aware of this. I, I don't imagine baseball teams Nobody can force anyone to be vaccinated. Uh, it fascinates me. I think there was a study came out on the English Premiership, the, the Football League, and it was saying something, that somewhere in excess of 90% of the players were vaccinated. I don't think it was far off the national average. You don't know why individuals would choose not to be vaccinated. But I've had my suspicions over one or two of the players playing for Scottish teams not appearing in away squads in some of our European games. Uh, obviously, fans of every team other than Rangers and Celtic can rest easy that clearly I'm not talking about them because that's not, not, not really an issue in playing away in Europe. Sorry, Dave. Um, so it, it, some, some countries are quite different. I mean, around Europe now, I think you can pretty much travel free but Dave's point about Canada, if if you or I were trying to get into Canada, we need a vaccination certificate, which if we go as a one-off holiday, um, we would be quite happy to show that and to prove it um, and, and even take tests. Uh, so for any Canadian player, we, we have to get a test to go into the US. I'm, I'm going in a couple of weeks' time. So would Canadian players have to get a test to go from Toronto over into to play some of their games as well. Um, I, I, I love journalism at times, how this suddenly becomes a big story because we've now resolved the last story, but are we actually going to have any baseball? And it's almost like, has it been ignored or have people just not bothered with it? And that, that's maybe a debate for another day. And if we had any professional journalists on the show, they could give us an insight into that type of mentality. Well, I wouldn't necessarily trust the word that they said, to be fair, though, Alan, to be fair. <laughs> uh, but Yorkshire, Dave, obviously the Yankees' troubles will be particularly 
weighing on you as a Boston Red Sox fan, I'm sure. So is it possible the Red Sox might get to take advantage of this then that presumably the Yankees might be missing some some individuals by the time Boston rock up for the opening day contest? Yeah, well, it, it, actually the opening day now is um, the 7th, was it the 7th of April? The opening day wasn't going to be, but um, yeah, Boston Red Sox have the pleasure of now opening up the three-game series in the Bronx. So uh, yeah, we'll sort of gladly take any um, problem that they have for that to, get, to try and get off to a good start because that's you know, the, you know that's the toughest of tough starts for um, for any team really, isn't it? especially Boston. Although uh, you know came came back well against them uh, last last season after a, a tough spell. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we 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 do laugh about the the rivalry and minor, you know, sort of. Uh, I certainly don't hold anything hugely against them, but it's nice to to take Boston's side in that rivalry, especially Absolutely. when we're winning. Absolutely, and a chance potentially to lay down a marker. You know, the opening series of the of the season as well. It would it would be a great start. Yeah. Um, I've, can't remember whether they were due. I think they probably were due to open up at um, Fenway originally, but they're now on the road um, to Boston, uh, to New York. I'm just trying to remember where they go next. Uh, it's Detroit, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I'm going to see. Yep, Alan, you'll have that one. Yeah. <laughs> we start with six games against my bullpen draws because uh, the first game would be the 7th of April and we've got a three-game trip to guaranteed rate field uh, in Chicago. Uh, and then we... Uh, oh, no, we're at home. We're at home to Chicago, aren't we? Yeah. And then we're at home to Boston, as you say, there as well. It's interesting. I don't know. that The original schedule... I don't know. Was quite odd if it, if it's showing. Oh, that, that'll be the the current schedule is showing these odd games. We're playing the Yankees on the first of April, but that's obviously spring training. Yeah, so that's what's happened there. So, yeah, we're we're making a quick start uh, against the Bullpen Bros. Uh, that's the only league that matters in town. See if you can soften them up for us then in spring training. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve Junior, yeah. sorry. I'm um, just uh, hot in the heels of White Sox versus Tigers. We roll into White Sox versus the Mariners uh, as the very next series. So there's definitely a little bit of rivalry going to be created mid mid April. Absolutely, mm. and are you quite quite confident, uh, Dave Junior, without attracting the ire of your fellow bullpen bros? Do you quite like the look of that start for the White Sox? It looks a decent opening. Um, I mean, it was meant to be Oakland, Arizona. Um, I, uh, sorry, no, that's not quite true. Um, the the, the start is going to be the start. Um, you'd like to feel that you can come out of April at worst, sort of 50 50, uh, and kind of build on that, um, specifically with all the issues over the last few weeks. Um, but I, I really want to see how the free agent situation goes because there's been a lot of moves. I haven't, I don't know if it's just the way my phone's set up. Um, but I haven't seen too many moves for you guys, um, your teams. Uh, but the White Sox have absolutely been making moves in the last couple of days, which is really heartening to see. And I think with with fans missing out on that action uh, over the last few months, everything really is quite madcap last minute, um, signing players. So I'm not sure if that's something we'll cover off later on in the show. But um, yeah, lots of action, lots of roster changes for us all to um, get our heads around. Absolutely. Tell, tell us a wee bit about what free agent means. Sorry, Dave. So if you bring that to the old world of Scottish football, I, I'd imagine the, the closest that you can get to it might be a Bosman signing, uh, someone that's been out of contract. Um, and again, with there being a lockout in baseball for the last few months, uh, the lockout means lockout and clubs haven't been able to well, legally or officially contact players. I'm not sure if things go on behind the scenes. Um, but there's just been absolutely no negotiations at all. So you've had over, I think it was around about 300 players, good players, players that played last season without a club, uh, without an organisation. And I think 
it's at times we can sit and look in Scotland and go, okay, there's a guy moving across from Hibs to Rangers, and they can probably keep the same home, uh, same family home, and, and commute to some extent, um, or even uh, something in the UK. You know, you get somebody moving up from Southampton up to Glasgow. Um, yes, there's a little bit of relocation there, but it always fascinates me in the states how you can just be. Uh, this is a different topic, but just traded, and then you know, okay. Tonight you're playing for Seattle, but tomorrow you've actually been traded and you're moving across to the Yankees. And you're like, well, hold on a minute here, I've got to go cross country. Um, and it's a real, real change in people's lives. So uh, from the free agent point of view, these men, uh, a couple of couple of weeks to go until they've got to kick things off for real. But before then, we've got a whole lot of spring training taking place just now. So they really need to get clubs so that they can settle their families, settle themselves meet their teammates uh, and, and kind of get part of that organisation. So that's that's what's ongoing just now, Alan. A whole yeah. lot of free transfers, um, guys making some good money, uh, perhaps you. guys that have been worried over the last few months about if they've even got a future in the game. Good, yeah. thank you. Richard, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to talk to you, and thanks, that's a really good explanation, Dave Jr. But uh, the Mariners have got a really hard start. The way it's transpired now with some of the changes, because there are we've got the Twins and the White Sox on the road, and then they come back for a home series against the Houston Astros. So mm. you know, given how you know how important a quick start is, if the Mariners are going to at least equal what they achieved last season and hopefully go one better and get that playoff spot, they're going to have to be at it right out the gate. But the, the good news is they made a couple of good acquisitions. They brought in. Outfielder Jesse Winker and infielder Eugenio Suarez from the Cincinnati Reds. I think the Reds are kind of uh, up for selling or for trading everyone at the moment. It looks like they are probably going to make major changes to their franchise as well. So I think there are a couple of good acquisitions. The the other side of that is Brandon Williamson going to Cincinnati and he was quite highly regarded uh, left-handed pitcher. But they look like good, good acquisitions. But as I say, the Mariners will need everybody to be at it right out the gate with a kind of start that's in, in store for us. So we will see how that goes. Good. Now, Alan, you mentioned that you will actually be heading stateside in the near future as well. Yes. Um, I've got a wee trip planned. Uh, uh, initially, it's a golf trip we, we booked for 2020, so, so rearranged. So I will... Either when I'm there or when I come back, I will bore you non-golfers about playing at Pinehurst. Uh, Pinehurst is the host venue, I believe, of the US Open. So what that means is they don't play it there all the time, but it's considered like, I think in a way it's considered a bit like St. Andrews to the Open here, uh, that, that it's in the schedule every eight years or 10 years. And uh, designed, of course, and I'll be paying homage to Donald Ross, a native of Ross and Cromarty, uh, the Highlands of Scotland, and a man who made his name throughout the golf courses of Scotland, but did a wee bit of work uh, over in the USA as well. As as many of these Scots professionals, course designers and caddies of that era went over to the States whilst the game was growing there. So I'll be doing that. But I will be... My intention is to take off some uh, NBA uh, NHL, where I'm actually going to see the Red Wings, which will be a highlight of the trip, good old Detroit Red Wings. Uh, I will fit in some uh, American soccer, not quite at MLS standard, but importantly, uh, my plan is to be at the opening day of the Durham Bulls, uh, of Durham Bull fame. So one I'm looking forward to, excited to go. They'll do fireworks at the end of the night as well. So. Uh, there'll be hot dogs, there'll be beer, there'll be popcorn, there'll be fireworks. Uh, and I will be representing the bullpen to cheer on the bulls. Excellent. Great to hear, Alan. Great to hear. And that part of the world, North Carolina, is one you're, you're pretty familiar with over the years, Alan. Yeah, I know the, the Carolinas fairly well. Uh, so I've been to Durham a couple of times. We're going, we're going to be based in, in Durham. We've been travelling around. Uh, we're Flying initially into Washington for a couple of days, then heading down to to Pinehurst. I've never, I've obviously never played there before. That'll be knocking that one off the the bucket list. 
climate should be quite good. Not too sunny for us Scots who might struggle if it was a wee bit too warm. It's the right time of the year for us to go. Uh, and obviously I shall not be venturing, but the, the Masters is on in Georgia when I'm there as well. Uh, so uh, a lot of sports fans will be heading to that as a big trip. And of course, we did the, the Masters podcast just last year as well, which was an absolutely fantastic chat we had last year about that. Yep. And, and well worth a listen again, I would say to listeners, because a lot of that is very timeless. It's talking about the experience of uh, sports journalist Ewan McLean, a uh, golf writer for many years with some of the leading Scottish newspaper titles, talking what it's like to actually get to play that storied course as an as an amateur and, and just to see that that and uh, some great stuff there. So definitely urge listeners to give that a listen as well ahead of this year's showpiece at Augusta. And and Alan Pinehurst is it is it you mentioned obviously Scott famous Scottish course designer. Does it have Scottish characteristics if you like? I, I appreciate it won't be a Lynx, I doubt, but does it have Scottish it's it's, it's not a it's not a Lynx, but uh, my my understanding it'll be very heavily influenced by the, the, the Scottish designs. Um, so lo looking forward to seeing how it actually uh, plays in real life. Uh, there are eight or nine courses and they've just introduced a nine hole pitch and putt course as well. There's a wee museum on, on site there. There will no doubt be numerous merchandise shops selling overpriced stuff. Uh, so it will be it will be of a Scottish nature. Um, I actually played a course in Spain fairly recently, which they said was designed in the Scottish sense. And, and the only comparisons I could really find were that it was windy and a bit chilly. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Scottish, when they talk about Scottish designs, they would primarily be talking about Lynx courses, very, very hard to replicate. I was, I was lucky enough today, I played around uh, Crail Golfing Society, a brilliant course just south uh, southeast of St Andrews. Um, you know what the weather's like in Glasgow, so 40, 50 miles away. I went around there, I had a new pair of white golf shoes, and they're still white at the end of 18 holes, which tells you the conditions you, you get in the in the East Coast as well. So uh, well, well worth the wee trip to go and do that. Did you play well then, Alan, since I thought we might have got a bit muddy if we had the trips into the, the long grass or the rough or behind a tree or some such thing? It, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm going to jinx myself here, but I do play well at Crail um, for, for my, my standard. Uh, I think I was five over today with a couple of birdies. So uh, at, at a poor start, I was I think four over after five, but then I, I came on to a bit of a game. But it's, it's nice and open for me. It was a bit... It was a bit Probably about 20 mile an hour winds, so not not too bad. Um, but as somebody who's a bit wild off the tee, some of the Lynx courses can be quite open and welcoming for me. I just made a suggestion to a friend over in the States if they wanted to help me at Pinehurst, maybe to get the chainsaw out and go and check what the trees are like. But hopefully nobody from Pinehurst is listening to this. <laughs> Oh, good stuff, Al. Good stuff. And we, we touched briefly there upon some of that. I mentioned some of the Mariners' acquisitions, uh, and we touched briefly upon that. Any anyone else got any thoughts around either acquisitions for their own teams or any kind of trades or signings that have really caught their eye, Dave Junior? It was more just a, a slight anecdote, Richard. But uh, we made a signing, uh, Joe Kelly. I don't know if the name rings a bell. So he was with uh, Boston for a wee while, uh, but what he most famously made the headlines for last season, uh, which has endeared himself already to the White Sox fans, uh, is last season whilst he played for the Dodgers. Um, and again, he coming off a pretty good season, but a kind of right-handed reliever. Um, he had a bit of a spat with the Astros. Um, I can't remember the boy's name, but it'd be Correa. Um, yeah, the shortstop. shortstop. Yeah, and uh, Bergman as well. So there was a wee bit of an incident, and I think we may have talked about it actually on the podcast at that point, where he was he was struggling with his pitching, um, and they were giving each other a bit of back and forth. At that point in the season, you had no fans in, so he was very well aware of what was coming out of the Astros dugout as well, 
in his general direction. So he didn't, you know, when he got the guys out, left the inning, uh, as all relievers should, you know, that's the whole point. You want to leave it as you find it, the game, uh, which he done so. Uh, three men out, no runs conceded. Um, and he made a point of letting the Astros dug out know exactly how he felt about their own comments. <laughs> so given that the Astros, um, they kind of ran over the White Sox last year, um, both during the season, but then also um, uh, in the playoffs as well. He's already endeared himself to the fans. But uh, we've made a couple of good signings, Richard, to answer your question. Uh, lots in the pitching department. Uh, we've filled that spot with a bit of a veteran in second base today. Uh, a guy that's played, uh, I think he actually he spent half the season at Boston, but I'm not sure if it was memorable or not. Um, and we're still looking for a right fielder, but the feeling is just now they may try to platoon two of the younger guys who who played, who broke through last season uh, as rookies. So they're thinking it's a good way to to fit them into the squad, into the team. Um, but I think a lot of White Sox fans are still thinking, well, could really do with a good a good big name out there. Interesting, Joe Kelly. I can see why he's really why he's kind of endeared himself to the fans. He's already said he reckons I've got the best team uh, in the in the American League. He's been quite uh, confident there as well. So I guess you'd like to see that confidence. And given he's won a couple of World Series, as you mentioned with the Red Sox and with the Dodgers, you've got to think he might know what he's talking about. So that's encouraging as well. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people reckon you've got an extremely strong bullpen even probably ahead of adding him into the ranks there. So certainly that gives you a really good foundation for the season ahead. Although I think Kelly's probably not going to be in the, the opening day action. I think he's rehabbing from an injury as well. Yeah, he's, he's injured. So they're going to take it nice and easy with him, but he's a quality addition to the squad. His eye might not be in it yet. <laughs> dear, dear, dear. Hello, boom and indeed boom. Yorkshire Dave, any particular trades or acquisitions in the world of baseball that have caught your eye? Well, talking about um, career, uh, the Houston Astros uh, shortstop, not sure whether he's... Um, we spoke about this last time because when um, our friend Rob Fontenot had me on his um, Astro, Astros podcast, he was talking about them. He's a free agent and very unlikely, or at that time, very unlikely to stay with the Astros and was talking about some mega deal, you know, 300 million plus 10, 12 years, whatever. But little snippets I've seen, it's not out of the question they might end up staying there. But um, on, on the Red Sox um, horizon, I think they'd already signed that even before the, um, you know, the lockout, they'd signed back Jackie Bradley Jr., one of the outfielders from... Um, a few years back, who is um, is a great defensive outfielder. I think some of the Red Sox fans are a little bit unsure about him coming back because his his batting might not be right up there. But um, you know, looking at uh, some of the comments that my <laughs> good friend Alex Cora, have you seen his beard? By the way, Alex Cora has got got a cracking beard, and it's a similar sort of uh, color scheme to mine, but much neater. I think I think the word is disciplined, isn't it? My beard is not disciplined. But he's talking about he wants you know, Red Sox won 92 games last year, but um he's talking about he wants a lot more consistency this this season and um you know especially defensively. So perhaps he wanted to tighten up the the defense and um get the get the outfield sorted out. Um Pitching, starting pitching is um, an issue for them. I think they've got uh, Ivaldi, Chris Sale and Nick Pivetta, the three certain starters. They've got a couple of newcomers. I think they both might be lefties. Michael Wacker, who has got a little bit of history against the Red Sox. I think he pitched a couple of times for them with the Cardinals in the 2013 World Series that the Red Sox won. I think he won the first game, but... I think the fans got to him in uh, one game. I read something, didn't really remember that particularly. But uh, anyway, he's a Red Sox fan. As as the Hibs fans used to sing about, um, um, who's the pundit? My, Mikey Stewart. Remember, he played for the Hearts and um, Hibs signed him. And, you know, it's not one of those trades that's done that often. But the song was going after he started, you know, he's, 
began to play reasonably well for him, quite a good player. And this, oh, Mikey, Mikey, <laughs> used to be a jambo, but he's all right now. So, um, yeah, there might be something similar going on with the with the Red Sox fans. But I think there'll be more to come from the Red Sox. So, yeah, I'd like to see some kind of, uh, I mean, all the Red Sox fans would like to see some sort of big money signing, you know, just for the hell of it, <laughs> if nothing else. Oh, Typical absolutely. Red Sox comment there, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think one thing we, we, we could probably all agree on, uh, you know, we're all fans of our, our teams, but most of all, we're fans of baseball. And that's the news of Fernando Tatis being out for the, the medium to long term. It's a blow for all, all of baseball, I reckon. Alan, what, what do you think? I mean, it looks like it could be three months on, on yeah. the sidelines. Yeah, he does. Um, Fernando Tatis does appear in our... Scottish all-star MLB team with a, a, a name like that. Uh, so, yeah, you, you want to see the big stars play. Um, although, interestingly, you, you when you talk about free agents and what moves Detroit, the Tigers could make, I, I, I'd probably, again, go back to type as a, when I look at my football team, and I'm one of those guys that likes to see the good in all the players that play from a team and I like to think if they're struggling they're going to come turn it around so I'm, I'm never unless there's a glaring omission I'm never one of those people that's looking at the the list of free agents and say well, so and so will be better than than what we've got here and, and obviously slightly biased in that I'm hoping for a big season again for Daz Cameron uh, have, having made the breakthrough at the end of the COVID shortened season then played a reasonable amount of games last year uh, you just he's obviously in the 40 man roster at spring training you really want to see Daz play regularly i want to see a lot of the young guys they've, they've got there come through and play regularly the the power rankings i read this week from mlb had the tigers i think in 16th spot so the the best of the the bottom half of the league so they're a franchise on the way up uh miggy has said it's the one thing he wants to deliver is a a World Series championship to Detroit before he retires. I suspect he'll struggle with that, but I, I'm, I'm I like to see my guys uh, come come in and, and do their thing. The the other interesting thing I've found out of the various um, negotiations for getting the the game back on track was the various changes that they made. So I'll be interested in the the guys' views on it. I'm I'm probably going to, again, stick with the view of being a traditionalist and and liking the old-fashioned rules. But I'm also going to give a shout-out for them changing the way the schedule is composed. I don't know if any of you guys have read about this, uh, but they've introduced what they're considering to be a more balanced schedule. So there were more interleague games. Um, So I think what that means is it's something like it, previously the White Sox and the Tigers being in the same division would have had uh, 84% of their games in common. It's now 91%. Uh, and, and teams in the same league have changed from 52% to 76%. So, so whilst I'm a traditionalist, as a statistical, logical person, I'm delighted to see that they're actually starting to to balance that up because it appeals to my state of mind. So be interested. That I know that the two Daves are probably going to come in and shoot me down. So who no, so no, no, Dave, no. Dave Senior going to come in first? No, I was uh, as ever, you've got numbers to back up your uh, statement. <laughs> the, the one thing that I had seen was actually there's quite a few changes they've made for 2022, but for season 2023 and beyond the balanced schedule. The bit that I read was saying that the, each team will be guaranteed to play at least one series against every opponent in both leagues, which, you know, I'm quite amazed at that because it's only relatively recently that you had any interleague play at all. But that sounds to me like a good thing. It sounds almost like uh, yeah, perhaps fairer, more balanced is definitely... Uh, and. Well, will interleague play be that 
as interesting without the uh, a novelty you know, value designated hitter. That was the one of the big things, wasn't it? See, so let's see the American League guy uh, uh, batting. But um, yeah, I, I think that uh, sounds like a, a good idea. But that's I think that's for next season. But yeah. maybe they're bringing in some changes um, this year as well. I think as a fan, if you go to the home games, you like the Tigers will now have the Dodgers. They'll play the Dodgers once a season, but they would only play the Dodgers at Comerica every second season. So I think there still is sufficient novelty factor in, in there. And of course, you know, the designated hitter becomes universal as well. So any thoughts on, on that, Dave Jr., maybe? Well, uh, just to back up your point, um, a minute ago, Alan, I think that's great. You think about trying to bring the fans back for these games, especially once there's been a little bit of disillusionment in the last few months. Think about all those young fans out there. You know, Tigers fans, you've you've used that example, that will never maybe get the chance to see like a Mookie Betts um, or, or something like that. They'll get this chance to go along and watch these potential greats come along. Not that Tigers aren't great, but you've got these, <laughs> these opposition coming to, to your home patch um, and if that's been a little bit rare beforehand, I don't think it's going to be diluted enough to make it, um, yeah, for the novelty to wear off. That feels like a good move. It really does. And on the flip side of the coin, you know, there's times last year you would hear, again, I'd be watching the White Sox commentary and they would comment on, you know, this is the, yeah. and it, I'm really sorry, Alan, to pick on the Tigers. But I think at one point, you know, the White Sox have won the last 13 occasions this year against the Tigers, and you know, you're still thinking there's there's more games to go this season. Between players, there must be a little bit of, all right, the Tigers <coughs> again, the Guardians again, you know, the the Twins again. If if you're playing each other too often, um, that might not be too healthy. So I, I like the fact if it's going to be spread out that bit more, uh, that feels good for both players and fans. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And Dave, and it's not one I thought of before, but the idea you've got the opportunity to see future legends of the game potentially coming to, as you see, your ballpark. Uh, that is a, a great a great plus side to it. And I think it's mostly all upside. The only thing I was going to ask is, are we moving towards almost the, the death of the notion of a National League and American League is actually meaning anything different whatsoever? It's 49 years We've had the designated hitter rule when it was actually introduced by the American League as a bit of a gimmick to try and boost attendance because they were trailing the National League hugely, absolutely massively at that point. Uh, and the National League clearly thinking, well, we're doing well. We don't need to change anything. Described as haughty in the media coverage of the time, their, their approach to it, whereas the kind of American League were willing to try and mix things up a bit to try and get more fans through the gates. So, you know, that was the history of it, but it's been there... Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it does make sense to, to kind of equalise it and, and there's, there's so many good things about it. Pitchers only hit one, 110 last season as a, as a group. You know, that's not that's not something people want to pay and see. I mean, four of us could probably hit about, well, half of that potentially. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think there is maybe something about that because I think it's now just over 20 years since the separate kind of league uh, presidents were, were done away with and we had the, the appointment of the kind of universal MLB commissioner. They stopped having their own umpires and stuff like that as well. So uh, while there's lots of positives, I do feel a little bit like Alan in this case, we're also losing just that little bit of tradition. But I think in terms of thumbs up or thumbs down, I'll give it certainly a, a thumbs up despite my concerns about the tradition. Dave Jr. It'll be interesting as well, Richard, um, just to bring it on to another point, but You've got this American League, this National League. It, it would be nice to have some slight nuances between the two, but we do need that path to the World Series itself. We do need the two leagues to give us teams uh, to fight it out, to see who's best. And again, with that, there's been the news this week um, that we're looking at 12 teams in the playoffs uh, going forward. So I know that there's been various changes over the, the recent years given COVID, um, but with 12 uh, going to make their way to the postseason. Um, does anyone have any thoughts or details about how that will look? I, I'd imagine are we looking at six from each league? Um, are we then looking at division winners? And then is it going to be second place teams or will that be broken down into 
um, your highest winning percentages, Alan. Yeah, yeah it's there, there's a one-off seeding for this, so I think currently it can change where you start your seeding. So it's the it's the three divisional winners plus the three best teams after that anywhere in the league, um, and so numbers. Th- Number three plays number six, and number four plays number five, um, and that is based purely on their winning percentage. So if it, if they're at, at six hundred or whatever, uh, that that'll determine their number. It stays at that number throughout it. So three and six and four and five play, and they play a three game series. I, I think currently there's a one game. The old the current system or the old last year system had a one game thing. So there's a three game series. Uh, one and two remain their, their seeds, and then the two winners then come through, and you then have the four teams. So one would presumably play the lowest ranked team who qualify, and two would play the highest ranked team who qualify to get into the the, the league championship game. Dave, it's good. It's good to know. Uh, it, it, to bring it full circle uh, back from the playoffs to the restructuring of the league, as you mentioned. Um, there, there's been this accusation that some teams have tanked over the years um, in, in terms of how they put their squad out for the coming year. But if you also think if you've got a division filled with with one or two teams that are not performing too well, then it must disrupt the, the winning percentages for teams over that season. And I, I know we all talked about Dave's division last year when you've got the Red Sox, you've got Toronto, you've got the Yankees and so on and so forth. Um, but you've, if you're looking at how those teams then play each other a certain amount of times or into league games, then by by broadening the types of games that all the teams are playing, I think you're going to make the winning percentage mean something more. So if you're the White Sox, if you've won 15 games against the Tigers one season, does that say a lot about the White Sox or does it say that the Tigers might not have a good team that year? Therefore, those 15 games which are contributed towards your winning percentage, do they mean much? As opposed to if you're playing more meaningful games across against the other 29 in the whole um, baseball structure, I think it evens it out. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's a good point as well about getting that kind of, yeah, that more kind of validated, you know, ultimate performance over the the course of, of the season as well. So, yeah, I think that's another... I think that's another broadly positive change as well. Maybe we've all, maybe the bullpen bros have all turned into softies over over the winter and spring. We're agreeing with everything, but well, let's see if we can break that streak. Then another change will be no ghost runner on second base and in any extra innings. So, how do we feel about that? And I think Yorkshire Dave is a man with a view here. Being being a massive traditionalist in the sport, I can't believe they're doing away with this already, you know. (laughs) (laughs) And they're just dumping it just like that. It's an absolute (laughs) disgrace. Well, no, I can I can live with that. I thought it was um, you know, you could see why they did it in the COVID season and they kept it going, didn't they? And they're trying to you know, didn't want the games to go on too long. So yeah, okay, fair enough. That's um, back back to square one. The, the other ones, you know, the designated hitter. I think I've said before that you know, I sort of uh, uh, guys will tell <laughs> tell you that works with me. You know, I wasn't someone who necessarily embraced change, but I am starting to to think about the designated hitter um, in the National League. Might be a good thing. Certainly a good thing for those forty plus. Uh, players who might, you know, like so, uh, likes of Nelson Cruz, you know, joking aside, you know, if if there wasn't these extra fifteen uh, designated spots, would you know, would he necessarily get another couple of seasons out of it? So I think it sort of uh, it's great for those guys who can just hit the baseball out of the park and don't necessarily. Have the speed to you know, to to get that quick to lay the bunt down and get to first base. So yeah, I don't, I don't mind that at all. And um, yeah, I think some of that. You know, this is what we had to agree to to get baseball going. Then it doesn't seem too bad. Um, I think they've tried to address this uh, tanking thing. Teams that are 
deliberately not trying to to win so that they get a, a higher draft pick and they I don't know quite how they how they're doing it but they're introducing kind of lottery effect to the draft aren't they so it's not just all on you know last is gets first pick so yeah I think there's some um, there's some good stuff in there looking forward to it yeah it should be great to see how how it looks in action and and the, and the way to do that to make sure you don't miss the action for what's going to be another fantastic MLB season is to make sure you subscribe to MLB TV, which provides fantastic coverage regardless of which team you follow. We would encourage everyone to, to check that out. Great value. It'll compare it to lots of other sports packages. And it's a fantastic deal. Not just all the MLB action, but fantastic documentaries, lots of additional content as well. So it's well worth checking out. And you can also follow MLB in social media. And make sure you also follow the Highland Bullpen on social media. And Alan, what's the best way for our listeners to do that? Uh, Twitter. Uh, Twitter's our main uh, vehicle. Uh, quite simply, Highland Bullpen. Uh, at Highland Bullpen. Uh, find us on there. We do a wee bit on Instagram and Facebook. And we, we do social media activity commensurate with our average age in the team. So uh, we're, we're always... Uh, looking to get better at stuff like that. We just enjoy coming on and having a chat and telling you what we're learning about and what have you. So uh, find us over there and you can message us through all these channels as well. So uh, it'll be good to hear from anyone when they when they get in touch with us. Maybe one last thing we could chat about in terms of the changes would be the, the bigger bags. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that's all about, the bigger bags for landing on base. Um, to me, that seems sensible. I don't think that's like making the goals bigger at football. You can't make the goals any bigger. Uh, I know you have to land on the bag, but is it really that bad to put an extra foot or whatever uh, on there in terms of size? Does anyone have any objections to that? You saw that thing. Was it you retweeted that um, amazing bit of footage where the guy... Um, the batter just smacked the ball up the middle of the of, of the of the park and um, was going to get at least a double, and it hit the second base bag, took a wicked deflection over to the to that second base man who just uh, who just calmly lobbed it to the first base and he was out. So um, yeah, I mean things like that can happen. So. I don't even know why they're doing that bigger bag. Is it sort of a safety feature? You do see guys that uh, break their fingers, don't they, diving in sort of head first and reaching out for the bag. They've got the second, third base. They've got to stay on the bag, haven't they? First base, you can you just run past it as long as you've touched it. Um, but to secure second or third base, you've got to actually touch the base and stay on it. So... Is it a safety feature, making it, um, you know, a slightly less dangerous activity? I'm not sure. I think that is part of the thinking. I think that's part of the thinking to make it safer and also just to make it a more attractive option to increase the possibility of people. So, so you know yourself, it's a very small margin, but baseball's all about these small margins, isn't it, that, that make all the difference? So, yeah, and I guess the only other thing is the... The, you know the kind of the ban on on teams playing the defensive shift uh, as well, which seems a, a little more strange to me because surely you're entitled to put your players yeah. wherever you want to on the field. I would have thought, but we'll we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, there's a there's a great quote, and I just can't remember who it was, but uh, one of the batsmen just from years ago just said, "Hit them where they ain't," and yeah. uh, you know if they're moving the the shift about, then yeah, I I don't quite follow this. It's been around for a long time, but it just got to um just got to a, a degree where it was affecting the, the scoring of runs, wasn't it? And hits. Um and as, as I understand it, they're saying probably from next season. I think are they trying it out? They do try these things out in the minor leagues first. I think they might be trying it out this this season and it, the the requirement will be that you have always have four 
infielders in play in the infield and there must be two infielders both on either side of um, second base. So you can't shift all three over to to the one place where the batsman percentage-wise throughout his career tends to hit the ball. So, um, yeah, it, it doesn't quite fit with our thinking of sport, isn't it? But yeah. we've got to look think- from their point of view. And um, if it is completely upsetting the great sport of baseball, then, you know, maybe they should try something. We'll see. Alan? I think as football fans, it's bizarre that you're not allowed to set yourself up strategically in a position that defends your position uh, to stop the other team from scoring. Uh, that, that's what you do. I, I was bemused. The, the zonal marking in football, I'll just mention that quickly because I need to mention Rangers win against Red Star Belgrade last week, 3-0. But when you look at the Red, Red Star had zonal marking at corners, um, and it was quite horrific when you actually watch it, that you basically end up with like half a dozen guys in their position and the Rangers players seemed quite free to move around and the, the Red Star players weren't going with them. It just seems that's their choice um, tactically. Uh, so as you're allowed to do that. It seemed bizarre. So the this, this shift seems obvious. D- Dave Jr., did you have a point? In general? Um, no, no. Uh, well, I think the, the the other example I would use maybe a more widespread. Uh, imagine if football teams were told you've got to set up four four two. Yeah. Every game, and it just seems. Uh, let's face it, coaches will find another way to do it. Uh, if you've got to leave two men either side of of second base, then you're just going to find your shortstop is within a ball here, of of crossing that line, and you're you know. You, your second baseman will be right over towards first base. If that's how they really want to do it, they'll teams find a way. And if it's not shifts, um, I'm not too sure. I mean, the White Sox were one of the teams who didn't really shift much last year. Half the fan base said, you've got to move with the times and actually shift. The other half of the fan base said, no, no, we're quite happy doing this. Don't really like the, the shift. So I'm not too sure. Um, each team must see it as a strength or a weakness and, and do it accordingly, which brings it back to Alan's point. If that's how you want to set up your team, then you know have nine men on the on the right-hand side if you want. Um, I, I bring it back further to Dave's point, a good batsman is going to look for those gaps and exploit them. Yeah, and historically, the, the bunt's been a useful weapon against the shift as well. So maybe we'll see, maybe you, we might have seen, had they not changed the rule, we might have seen a resurgence of the bunt, which I would have enjoyed, I quite like it, because it's kind of a unique place in baseball, yeah. as baseball as well. Now, now we've talked about how the MLB has shifted the, the postseason lineup, how it's going to work with the 12 teams. But ultimately, as we also mentioned, the Ameri- American League champions will compete with the National League champions, and one of them will become the world champions through this year's World Series, but what that means is that we'll never have a Yankees versus a Red Sox World Series because those two great and storied franchises both operate in the American League. What would the world look like we are once you get into the postseason, or perhaps you know at one stage, it's a a random draw in the way it is in football because in Scottish football in the last week our Scottish Cup, which is our primary cup competition, as opposed to the league. Uh, its semi-finals have pitted the two biggest teams, with all due respect to our Edinburgh friends, Celtic and Rangers, the old firm against each other in one semi-final, but also Hibs versus Hearts, the two giants from Scotland's capital. Edinburgh will face each other in the opposite semi-final. Now, it makes for a fantastic set of semi-finals, but it did just got me thinking what would baseball look like in a world where we could have a Yankees-Red Sox World Series. Alan, hopefully I've not blown your mind with that prospect. What do you make of that? It's a great observation, Richard. And uh, yes, I'm sufficiently traditionalist. I hadn't even put my mind there. But I was I was initially fascinated when I learned that there had never been semi-finals in the Cup before of Rangers and Celtic and Hibs and Hearts at the same time. In a way, it makes an awful lot of sense because you've got to have the four of them get in there. And then once you have the four of them in there, 
And, and of course, pre-1998, the draw was probably fixed to make sure there was a Rangers and Celtic final anyway. So, uh, I, sorry, Dave. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> um, but that was the, the, the SFA's hope. So, yeah, I like... I like the fact. I like the fact you've got an American League champion and a National League champion. So, having blown my mind, Richard, and initially thinking, "What a lot of tosh!" I've got to go away and think about that because there's it. It is. It is odd that the like the Dodgers and the Giants, the Red Sox and the Yankees. Those would be great games. They're not. They're great when they're in the National League Championship or the American League Championship. It's not. Yeah, it's not quite the same as the World Series. So uh, I'll I'll come back to you on that mind blowing point. Okay. Yorkshire Dave is a man who values tradition quite rightly. Have I committed sacrilege by even floating that as a mad idea? No, I thought it was a great point. And um, you know, sort of someone who really likes the history of the sport and particularly the 1950s, where it was all sort of East Coast teams and was it two leagues of eight I mean, we've talked about this before and, and, and quite simply the postseason was the <laughs> the world series you know whoever finished top of the eight uh, american league teams played the top of the uh you know the eight national league teams and then you had that game that we talk about a lot because of the bobby thompson the shot heard around the world and that was um a so one-off series or a three-game series, certainly the um, between the, the the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers to to get to the finals. So um, yeah, I you know ultimately what you said there about um, you know if you get if you got to the last four, why wouldn't you say well okay we'll do a draw and it could be a Red Sox Yankees or a Cubs White Sox. Uh, um, well, it could be a Cubs White Sox anyway, and that was silly. But um, you know what I mean. But uh, yeah, talk, <laughs> imagine that if you, if uh, Rangers and Celtic were in the same league and couldn't play in the final, it's not a bad idea. But I, I did, I did hear that um, the, the semi-finals being described as um, one is the the vinegar semi-final and the other is the sauce, the sauce. Uh, semi-final, and that's a, a, a reference to <laughs> what, what the average fo- football fan in Scotland prefers on their fish and chips or their pie supper. So it's either salt and vinegar or salt and sauce, which is a, I never quite worked. I lived in Edinburgh for 10 years, and I'll, I'll never forget the first time I went to my local fish and chip shop. Fish and chips, please. And he said, salt and sauce. And as he was saying the words, he was squirting this strange liquid all over my <laughs> face. <laughs> you know, I thought, what on earth is he doing? <laughs> so, you know, it was already on there. And I just said, oh, right, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it wasn't my cup of tea, that, if I can use that phrase. Yeah. But, well, yeah, yeah the old Hebs back in the semi-final. The cup specialists, as I like to call them. Can, <laughs> can you be a cup specialist if you don't really quite win the cup? But looking at their record over this century, this will be the, you know, if they get there, if they beat Hearts, which is a big ask, um, this will be the 10th major cup final this century in 22 years. You know, they've already been in. Um, five Scottish Cup finals, four League Cups. I've only won one of each, but you know it's a pretty decent record. Absolutely, no, definitely Cup specialist. And for the benefits of American listeners, that whole salt and vinegar for us sensible West Coasters and the salt and sauce nonsense that the Mad East Coast is going for. It's the Scottish culinary equivalent of the Mason Dixon line. Basically, that that's the that is the divide we have our, our cultural and culinary divide there uh, but yes it's a fascinating lineup in, in the Scottish Cup semi-finals and Dave Junior what do you make of that idea because there will have been lots of times in baseball's history where the best two two teams happen to be that year in either the American League or the National League and you know that's decided obviously in the championship series but actually 
the team they eventually face in the World Series might not be the se- might not be the second best team. They might not even be the third or fourth best team. They are just the best team in that league that year. Dave Junior. It's interesting. And again, it's that whole, the way that Americans build towards their showpiece of whatever sport that is. Um, when I say it's similar, it's very similar amongst basketball, American football, baseball. I, I don't know if ice hockey is the same. But it really is a stark contrast to how we operate. You know, we're quite structured with our no, 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 no. We, we need a league. We need to play each other, and then just the best is the best, and that's it. And you've got some side uh, kind of cup competitions. So no, I think it's really interesting how the Americans do that. Um, you're always going to have a World Series situation, so it's really about how you get there. Um, I, I do wonder: Are you going to see six divisions for the rest of time in the MLB? Are you really going to see three for each league? Might they just make that two leagues of 15 uh, and you kind of battle it out and you you know, you know play the other 14 teams at a certain amount of times with a little bit of interleague? Who knows how things go over the years? Um, but no, I mean, I'm a guy, Richard, that will lie in bed and restructure Scottish football until about four in the morning. Um, and, you know, n- numerous times over the years where you think you can come up with a better structure. So it's, I'm all open to trying these new ideas. We even look at Scottish football and think about the top six. Everyone had a right good moan about the split. Um, and although you know, my own team, Rangers, haven't featured too heavily uh, in terms of being bottom six or, or flirting with, with that line at all, I can still see that it gives a lot of teams meaning at the end of the season where, it, where these games had been meaningless. And I think it's became a bit of a staple within Scottish football. Add into that your playoffs to get into the Premier League as a whole. Um, I think we, we do make changes, and we I, I like to think that sports in general will keep what's good and they'll bend what's not. So, um, yeah, excited to see what the future holds. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Dave Jr. Now, I believe, Alan, has there been some recent ground hopping action taking place? I know we discussed that previously. Our, you know, our, our visits individually as a, as a collective to various sports grounds around the UK, but also, as you mentioned, Alan, shortly in America as well. So, Alan, have you been up to anything in the ground hopping front of late? Yes, I did. A, I ticked off another English league ground at the weekend. Um, I told young Dave that I was away for a, a bit of a cultural weekend with my daughter in London to watch a couple of musical theatre shows and then the first thing he sees is me checking in on footballogy for the mighty AFC Wimbledon against Lincoln City at the Cherry Red Records Stadium. Uh, I do have a compilation album from Cherry Red Records from the 1980s I think so uh, it it was good I got to fist bump one of the the Wombles uh, so that'll go down in the in, in history as a great occasion. He actually came to me. He was going along the whole crowd. I wasn't going to bother. I was just too cool for that. But the Womble wanted to fist bump me. So I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll play along with the crowd here. Um, interesting wee stadium. Actually, I put a picture on our in- Instagram uh, page because the outside of the stadium, one part, I thought it looked more, looked more like a ballpark. Uh, it had like a green surround and the sort of highest walls to get in at. Eight, 9,000 seater stadium, quite a compact wee thing. Wasn't the greatest game of football I've seen, uh, but I've, I've ticked it off the list. Uh, one of the exciting moments of the game was seeing Dave Senior check in to Humphreston FC hosting Armadale Thistle in the east of Scotland League, whichever level that was. So that I want to. That this story will be on the blog by the time the podcast comes out, but we want to hear a wee bit more about Pumpferton. <laughs> yeah, well, I found myself at a loose end on Saturday. I was up visiting uh, uh, mother-in-law up in Edinburgh, and uh, the distaff side of the family were enjoying a civilised uh, afternoon <laughs> In the, in the capital, so I thought, well, what could I do? What could I do? Let's have a look at ground hopping. And uh, the standout fixture just had to be Pumperson Juniors versus Armadale Thistle. And fortunately, you know, I'm reliant on um, public transport. It also allows you to have a drink, by the way. 
Um, and uh, yeah, fortunately, the X24 first bus uh, <laughs> goes from South Gyle to uh, the tiny village of uh, Pumperston. And uh, yeah, I made it. It was a great day for football as well. Really good spring day. Uh, fantastic. You know, I, I could actually, I, I couldn't recommend it more highly. And, you know, pie and bovril, pies, scotch pies provided by um, Bog Hall Butchers of Bathgate. I think I've got that right. A uh, good bit of alliteration there. And uh, six, yeah, unfortunately, you always support the home team, don't you? Root, root, root for the home team. And uh, unfortunately, Pumberson were a bit bit outplayed by Armadale. And I hadn't looked at the, the league table before, but um, yeah, it told a story and explained the situation. They were pretty good. One of the, I don't know whether Wikipedia have got this right, but it certainly looked like a big park. And it did say that the Recreation Park Pumperson is one of the biggest pitches in Scottish football. And it, it certainly looked that way. Certainly, uh, Armadale spread the ball about a bit and they did stretch Pumphy, as I now <laughs> refer to them, <laughs> defence. And, uh, you know, it was 6 0. They, they, their goalkeeper actually played pretty well. He made a great block from the, the centre forward and then a couple of minutes later uh, saved a penalty. Um, but yeah, yeah, it ended up. Um, 6 0 to Armadale, and there was a there's quite a big traveling traveling support there. You got the bus over from uh, Armadale, it's a, it's a east of Scotland league, and there's, there's several conferences. So I don't know what tier they're in, but this was Conference X. <laughs> Why there's Conference A, B, and then there's Conference X, and that's where Pompey are. So, um, yeah, I don't know whether you get promoted to another conference and get further up the, the ladder. But yeah, it was it was great. Yeah, really good afternoon. And then uh, got the bus back and I thought, I'll go for a pint in, you, you'll remember this, so back in the 80s, the Centurion, Gustafin, didn't we used to go in there after after occasional games that we played? And uh, well, that was... Uh, it, Still looked like the 1980s in there, actually. <laughs> it was great. Brilliant, great stuff. I'm still reeling a bit from Alan bonding with Wombles and uh, David, uh, Yorkshire Day there watching Pumferston being being pumped. But uh, Dave Jr., we're, we're rapidly running out of, of time here. And, and you'll go some to top Alan's Wombles story. But uh, I think you've got like, a nice little note for us to finish off on, Dave Jr. Yeah, it was just, um, you know, Dave made a, a good habit last year of throwing out a few good quiz questions, and it fits in nicely with Dave's visit to Pumferston. Um, but also, my own son well, I was talking about trying to, he's downloaded Footballogy, uh, and we've put back and recorded all of his games over the years, which is which is right. good. Um, but he's written down a list of the ones in Scotland he would like to get to, and he, he said, I want to get along to every ground, with more than 10,000 capacity. So my question to you guys is, can you name those grounds? So well, I'll give you a clue. You know, so I'll take one of the equation. One of them doesn't have a team aligned to them, as in Hamden. So Hamden is second in the list. Um, but can you name the other teams in Scotland with a capacity of over 10,000 pounds? Well, the yeah. salt, there's... Vinegar and sauce uh, semi-finals would take care of four of them. There we go. Right, OK. Celtic, Rangers, Hibs and Hearts. Very good, yep. City. Very good, City Aberdeen. Pitodre, OK. So that's your, that's your top six that you've got. OK. Now it gets a bit harder, Dave Jr. So why don't we go through each just one by one? And we can be eliminated or survive. How does that sound if we're getting that, going that sounds them? like a volunteer, Richard? On you go. Oh, it does. No, no, no. Let me see what I can come up with. I will go for Tanadice, home of Dundee United. Tanadice is in there. That's uh, number eight. Uh, on to Rug Alan. Rugby Park, Rugby home Park. of Kilmarnock Football Club. Correct. Dave. 
I would go for Motherwell. Uh, yes, Motherwell's in there. Well, Hibs must have swelled their capacity by, you know, <laughs> amounts quite recently, actually. There seem to be a lot of them there. I mean, a rare old time. So that is the that's the top nine that you've managed to get there in order. Where hopefully no cheating. The did tenth you, ones surprised me. Did you tell us how many there were? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's me next, is it, Dave Junior? I believe I'm yeah. feeling the heat. Again, you don't need to do them in order. There's a couple of obvious ones, but the the next one on the list really surprised me. I will go for Dens Park. Home Dens of Park Dundee is FC. in there. Yes. 12,085. Uh, Alan? Livingston. Livingston is bottom of the list. 10,016. Oh, that's 16, oh, pe- oh, 17 oh, oh. people have helped me. Oh, <laughs> nice one, Alan. Would never have guessed that. Um, Dave? Pressure's on, isn't it? I think it's still there. It's third Lamech. <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> no. That was uh, that was a joke, but I think it, it pretty much is still still around, isn't it? It's quite Kafkin Park. Near Hamden, uh, yep. I have played at Kafkin Park before. Have you? Oh, uh, wow. I used it for schools football when I was a lad. It was still in use for schools football at that yeah, point. Yeah, you were so. you were playing in the sixties there, Richard. Don't kid us on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I had to wait to wait till the high high players cleared off after training. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. It's down to me and it pressures on. <clears throat> so is that Dave, is there a really sort of surprising one that you would absolutely not get unless or are they all pretty much being in the Premier League? Because I've got I've all have a Premier League representation in my lifetime. All oh, right. Uh, so, football fan, except one. Yeah, because cause I reckon. Going back, I went to a, a friendly game there years ago, uh, East Fife. I'm sure you could have got 10,000 in there. There wasn't 10,000 that day, though, when they played Witten Albion. <laughs> I think East Fife have got a new stadium, though. Have they? Those, uh, yeah. Um, it used to, what is it, Bayview? Bayview, yeah. Bayview. I'm going to go with um, St. Johnson. St. Johnson, there we go. McDermott Park, uh, 10,673. Oh, just snuck in there. Ricardo? I am... Um, to give you an idea, we've got six left. Six left, wow. Six. Has, have we said Rugby Park yet? Has that been... Yes. Uh, no, uh, we have said it. Oh, sorry. Apologies. Okay. Uh, do you know, I've got a feeling that either... I mean, you shouldn't mention them both, but there's two teams currently in the championship that I'm thinking of that might well have a capacity. I will go for Partick Thistle. Correct. There's another one. Well done, 10,887. I'm looking at two teams in the championship. I... And I think the one that's going to su- you're surprised at, I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to get this right, is Wraith Rovers. Uh, Wraith is in there, uh, 10,104 Starks Park. It's that's sweet. not the one I was surprised about. There's a, a smaller venue, in my opinion, than that. Oh, it's down to me, isn't it? I'm going to do it. The Englishman's going to get this wrong. <clears throat> so, where are we? <laughs> That'll be my favourite, Glebe Park. That, that's another joke. <laughs> the one with the hedge that was down the side of it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll go for... Let me see, let me see. It's, it's getting tough, I've got to admit. It's getting yeah. tough. It's a, a long time since it's been there. Maybe a new one. St Mirren. No. 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 Uh, St Mirren's just over 8,000. Yeah. Because it's a new one. I think the old Love Street would have been over 10, I suspect. Yeah, yeah, I've been there a couple of times, but a long, long time ago, 80s, 90s so, era. Um, so, let's see. What about, uh, is there any in the sort of, uh, 
in the frozen north. I wouldn't have said so. No. Take nah. your I've, messages. I've got I've got another suggestion, Dave Junior. Go for it, Rich. The other championship side I was thinking of was Greenock Morton and Capolo. Capolo is well oh, up there. Yes. Nice one. Uh, 12,011. Right. I'm now going to go for, I think it's my turn, Clyde. No. 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 But you're not too far away. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a winner, Dave Junior? Just out of interest. <laughs> Last man standing. So we've got we've got three three grounds left. There's one not too far from Broadwood. Falkirk. No. They're not on the list either. No. Falkirk. Oh, uh, Airdrie. Excelsior. Airdrie. Yeah, so Excelsior Stadium. Uh, wow. just over ten thousand as well, which I, I didn't realise, but it makes sense. I think they do stage quite a lot of Scotland under games or women's yeah. games for the national team. Uh, I'm sure there's been some other sporting events there, uh, maybe some concerts as well. No so. football there, anyway. <laughs> no, no. Was much. there not a point as well where you had to have a minimum of 10,000 seats? Was that not one of the rules that the Scottish Premier League had for a while uh, before they realised it was yet another daft one yeah. and really arbitrary? So I wonder if that might be why there's quite a few hovering around that mark. I think that's why Inverness have all the, the record low attendances because they were forced to play in like Motherwell and Aberdeen and were getting. 500 people at the games. Could be. So we've got three left. So two left then. David. Two left. Hamil- I don't believe Hamilton Aki's has got 10,000. Correct. Yeah. It doesn't. Air United. Air United. Good shout. Yeah. So Somerset Park, that's one of the higher, one of the ones higher on the list. Uh, they're 10th in the country, believe it or not, uh, which, which really surprised me. Uh, 12,175. Mm. Um, again, never in my lifetime have they been remotely um, kind of yeah. near the top flight. One of these underachiever teams of Scottish football, though, because it has always been traditionally a fair sized town and, and a wealthy one in its day. Uh, yeah, I guess. Like, is it the same kind of thing, Dave Jr., like Capel or Somerset Park? These are old fashioned, traditional. Grounds uh, of that, yeah. I would have said so, yes. East End Park? East End Park. Yeah. Finalises the list. Well done, Richard. Well done. Oh, that's some firming. Yeah. And so again, just under 12,000. But again, I was really surprised, not only that you've got 18, sorry, uh, yeah, 18 grounds in, on the list. Uh, for a wee country like Scotland, over 10,000 is quite a lot. And again, I know you're not taking into account other sports, you know, Murrayfield, etc. Um, but no, I, th- I thought that was a, a hell of a lot uh, in there to be over 10,000. In particular, against Somerset, really surprised me. Oh, it's a terrific, terrific quiz and a great way to finish off the Highland bullpen this week. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about baseball trades and such things and finding out what's happening in New York next time you join us in the Highland bullpen. And we hope that Alan's namesake does, can dazzle this season as he so clearly would like to see him do. But until next time, this has been the Highland Bill Pen. See you then. Mm-hmm.